Hello, friends. I'm Professor Filip Kovacevic, and this is the 17th edition of the Russian Newspapers Monitor. I am glad to report that the Newsbud membership drive has started. I would like to encourage you to subscribe and become a member of the Newsbud community. Not only will you get some exclusive content, which you can find nowhere else, but you will also help us to provide you with even more programs and analyses like this one. Newsbud is a people-oriented media organization, which neither has nor wants corporate, foundation, and government sponsors. We are independent, objective, and nonpartisan. Be a part of our Newsbud community, and let us build together a more people-friendly world. Now, let's turn our attention to what we are doing here, discussing the front page news published in major Russian newspapers. Today, we'll begin with the front page of Nezavisimae Vajenaje Abazrenie, Independent Military Observer, the weekly Russian military-oriented newspaper, the edition for January 20th, 2017. On the front page, we find an article with an ominous title. The West is getting ready for another drunk nach Osten, which is a well-known German phrase meaning a trust toward the East. The subtitle explains that only nuclear weapons could prevent a continental war between NATO and Russia. Below the title, there is a photograph of the US tanks covered with snow. The commentary below the photograph is sarcastic. Americans think it's possible to fight in Russia with weapons designed for hot and dry climates. The article reports that about 2,500 pieces of U.S. military equipment have been unloaded in the German port city of Bremerhaven and sent further east. Among them, there are 87 Abrams tanks, 18 self-propelled howitzers, Paladin, 114 Bradley fighting vehicles, and other armored carriers. The weapons are accompanied by 3,500 U.S. soldiers. According to the article, this marks the beginning of the Operation Atlantic Resolve, in the course of which more than 6,000 pieces of the U.S. military equipment will be sent and positioned in Eastern Europe. The article states that this operation exposes a typical pattern in the functioning of the U.S. bureaucracy, considering that it was planned in 2014, but is being implemented only now. The article claims that stopping it would be just as difficult as it was to start it, and it, it would take just as much time, no matter what the new presidential administration of Donald Trump decides about it. According to the article, even if Trump wants to stop it and the Congress agrees, which does not seem likely, it would take years. And in the meantime, U.S. weapons would continue to get shipped and positioned on the Russian borders. The article emphasizes that out of total 6,000 military pieces, 3,600 are supposed to be tanks and armored carriers to be operated by four U.S. military brigades, which, in the case of need, would be transported to Europe by air. The weapons are to be positioned on the front lines from Estonia in the north to Bulgaria in the south. The article recalls that for the invasion of Iraq in 2003, U.S. military used around 2,800 tanks and armored carriers and that it took about half a year 
for the Pentagon to prepare the forces. On the one hand, Operation Atlantic Resolve allows the Pentagon to have even larger number of forces in place on the Russian border. The key question, according to the article, is why this is done. The article notes that at the start of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, the Nazis had about 17 tank divisions with 3,300 tanks on the Soviet border. Now, NATO's 3,600 tanks and armored carriers is more than that. And in addition, it is much more than can be serviced by only four U.S. Army brigades. According to the article, a typical U.S. Army brigade has about 260 to 350 tanks and 430 to 680 other armored equipment. This means that for 3,600 units, there must be at least 10 brigades, which means many more thousands of soldiers. The U.S. military command also counts on being able to use the transportation and communication networks set up during the Cold War by the Soviets in the countries of the former Warsaw Pact, as well as in the former Soviet republics of the Soviet Union. According to the article, the U.S. military equipment, which is sent to Eastern Europe, has primarily an offensive character. The presence of these weapons on the Russian borders looks even more troubling because both St. Petersburg and Russia and, and Moscow are not far away. They're only about 120 kilometers from the Russian-Estonian border to St. Petersburg and about 600 kilometers from the Russian-Latvian border to Moscow. If NATO troops are let into Ukraine, which is something that the Kiev government would gladly do in case of the NATO attack on Russia, the distance to Moscow is even shorter. According to the article, the only way for Moscow to react would be to use nuclear weapons. The article claims that this is why we can only speak hypothetically about a continental war between NATO and Russia. Any hot war between the two would end up creating a nuclear apocalypse on the planet Earth. However, the article looks in more detail into what kinds of forces the U.S. and its NATO allies could accumulate on the Russian borders. After examining the non-nuclear military capabilities of France, Britain, Germany, Poland, and other NATO allies, which they could use, and their troop numbers, as well as the fighting morale, the article concludes that they are much too small to hope for success. In addition, the geostrategic position of the Kaliningrad enclave with the Iskander M missiles located there enables Russia to cover the entire territory of Poland the greater part of the Baltic Sea, and even some eastern regions of Germany. Even the Danish capital of Copenhagen is not outside their range. The article notes that the Russian missile defense system could successfully defend the Russian territory from the NATO missiles. Russia also has an advantage in the number of tanks and anti-tank equipment. According to the article, the wars in Iraq and Syria demonstrated that the Abrams and Leopard tanks were not difficult to destroy by older anti-tank weaponry than the Russian military possesses at this time. Lastly, the number of soldiers and other citizens Russia could mobilize in defense is much greater than what the United States and NATO members could put together. And if we take into consideration that they are defending their motherland, any possibility of defeat is out of the question. The purpose of this article is to demonstrate the futility of NATO buildup on the Russian borders. The buildup is being implemented, in my opinion, purely for the domestic political purposes of the corrupt Eastern European political elites. It is much easier to control the population if the fear of an external danger is constantly being manufactured. In truth, 
any kind of offensive action against Russia would result in defeat and tremendous loss of life and resources. This is why it would be much more fruitful for the Eastern European countries to replace their current warmongering nationalist elites and elect those political forces which will emphasize economic cooperation and mutual understanding with Russia. In order for Eastern Europe to be prosperous and politically stable, Russia must be a friend and not an enemy. Now, let's look at the front page of Rasiskaya Gazeta, the Russian government-owned newspaper, the edition for January 23rd, 2017. On the top of the front page, we see the photo of the Russian agriculture minister, Alexander Kachov, and the title says, Kachov got to Berlin, exclusive interview about his negotiations with the German colleagues. The article continues on page seven of the newspaper. It reports that Germany found a way to invite the Russian agriculture minister Kachov to Berlin, even though he's included on the list of the sanctioned individuals whose travel to the EU is prohibited. This, of course, is the sign that the EU sanctions against Russia are actively being eroded and that they are probably on the way out, at least as some countries in the EU are concerned. In Berlin, Kachov took part in the summit of the agriculture ministers of the G20, the presidency of which is at this time held by Germany. He met with his German colleague as well as the ministers of other countries. Let's look at the most important things that Kachov said in this interview. First of all, Kachov recalled that three years ago, when the EU imposed economic sanctions on Russia, Russia responded by blocking the import of the EU agricultural products. As a result, the EU lost its second biggest market and suffered tremendous economic losses. For instance, the German exports of agricultural products to Russia decreased two times compared to 2013, and the German economy lost about a billion dollars a year. According to Tkachov, this is why it is no wonder that the Germans want to re-establish economic ties with Russia. In addition, Tkachov said that Russia itself possessed a great agricultural potential, not only to feed its own population, but also to become an important player on the global scene. He claimed that the policies of the Russian government since the imposition of the EU sanctions had made great strides in this direction. Moreover, Tkachov said that his meeting with the German Minister of Agriculture, Christian Schmidt, was very fruitful. He said that the German investors were still very much present in Russia and that they have found ways to keep investing even under the sanctions. In addition, Tkachov and Schmidt decided to re-establish certain mechanisms of bilateral cooperation that were frozen with the imposition of sanctions. According to Tkachov, considering that the sanctions would be lifted, as he said, quote, sooner or later, end quote, it was important to get everything in place so that the economies of both countries could benefit right away. Kachov also reported that he met with agriculture ministers of Mexico and Brazil and negotiated several bilateral agreements dealing with the import into Russia of meats and fruits and the export of Russian grain and sugar products. Kachov said that the Russian consumer would soon be able to buy more products from Mexico, Brazil, and other G20 countries which took part in the work of the summit. According to Tkachov, Russia is already self-sufficient in producing many types of food. And even under the conditions of the EU and the US sanctions, Russia succeeded in increasing the food exports by 4% last year. In my opinion, 
this article demonstrates that the appetite for the anti-Russian sanctions is waning in Europe. The Germans are even willing to break with the EU official policy of banning the top Russian officials from entering Germany in order to be able to establish some of the ruptured economic ties with Russia. In the coming period, we'll see even more of these kinds of developments. It is already clear that the sanctions have failed in their intended purpose to cripple the Russian economy and effect the regime change in Russia. In fact, they have led to the opposite results. Vladimir Putin is as popular as ever, and the sanctions hurt more the EU economies than the Russian economy. The Russians have shown that they could do quite a lot even without the Europeans. And so I expect that the misguided and counterproductive policy of sanctions will most likely be abandoned by the end of this year. Let's move to the front page of Nezavisimaya Gazeta, the middle of the road newspaper, the edition for January 24, 2017. At the bottom right of the front page, we find an article entitled, Kiev wants to organize a meeting between Trump and Poroshenko. The subtitle explains that the Ukrainian president will try to convince the new president of the United States in the correctness of the Ukrainian position on the Donbass and the Crimea. The article reports that starting on February 1st, Ukraine will preside over the Security Council of the United Nations for one month. The Ukrainian plan is to organize two Security Council meetings during this time, one of which would be attended by the President Poroshenko. According to the article, Poroshenko wants to use this visit to the United States to meet with Donald Trump. Poroshenko's intention is to insist to Trump that Kiev has no intention in giving up on the Donbass and the Crimea. In line with this policy, the Ukrainian parliament, the Verkhovna Yarada, proclaimed the Crimea a temporarily occupied territory. The article notes that there have recently been some rumors in Kiev that Trump might make a deal with Putin involving the Crimea and the Donbass. In other words, the US would accept the Russian jurisdiction over the Crimea and the Russians would agree with Kiev's reassuming the jurisdiction over the rebellious provinces in the east, the self-proclaimed Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. The article reports that Poroshenko officially rejected these rumors. He stated that his political agenda as the president was to return the entire Ukrainian territory under Kiev's rule. In his words, quote, the aim of Russia is not only Donetsk or Lugansk, not only the Crimea or Sevastopol. The aim of Russia is the whole of Ukraine, end quote. Mikhail Pashkov, the international affairs specialist contacted by the newspaper, stated that it was not clear how the new U.S. administration would react to Poroshenko's message. According to Pashkov, Donald Trump has made several contradictory statements regarding his relations to Ukraine and the Crimea, and there is no official White House policy as yet. The article also reports that the Kiev government would like to see international peacekeepers in the Donbass, either by the UN or the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. The article cites the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, as being opposed to both initiatives. The Ukrainian ambassador to the United States, Valery Chali, is quoted as saying that he was able to speak with Trump briefly during the inauguration festivities. He confirmed that there was a plan by the Ukrainian government for Poroshenko to have a meeting with Trump, but that they are still waiting for the response of the US side. In my opinion, 
it is not likely that Trump will meet with Poroshenko before meeting with Putin. This is in line with Trump's pre- and post-election rhetoric and activities. I'm sure that this is also the expectation of the Russian government. It would be a kind of the Russian diplomatic defeat, and it would also demonstrate a clear continuity with the Ukraine policies of the Obama administration if Trump met with Poroshenko first. There is no reason to expect that Trump will continue the one-sided anti-Russian policies in Ukraine promoted by the former Vice President Joe Biden and the Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland. However, he would not be the first president to break his promises as soon as he entered the White House. I'm sure it won't take too long before we find out how Trump decides to proceed on this issue. Now, let's look at the front page of Commerçant, the main liberal newspaper in Russia, which is occasionally critical of the Russian government's economic and foreign policy. The edition is for January 24th, 2017. On the front page, there is a color photograph of the U.S. President Donald Trump holding in his hands a signed memorandum on the U.S. withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. The title of the article is ironic and reads, Free trade becomes the main commodity. The subtitle explains that the United States has turned away from TPP in favor of bilateral trade deals. The article reports that the first significant step of the new U.S. president was to sign a memorandum on the U.S. withdrawal from the TTP. This decision, according to the article, will also force force Russia to rethink its economic and trade policies in the Pacific region. The article reports that the memorandum was signed after Trump's meeting with the heads of the so-called U.S. Industry Committee, which includes Ford, Dow Chemical, Dell, Johnson & Johnson, Lockheed Martin, Arconic, U.S. Steel, Tesla, Corning, and International Paper. The article notes that Trump also stated that he planned to renegotiate NAFTA, which is a free trade agreement between the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and make it, as he said, more fair in relation to American workers. His nominee to the post of the Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross, stated that the United States was bound to get a better deal in bilateral negotiations than under the collective trade agreements. The article reports that five countries ratified the TPP so far. Singapore, New Zealand, Brunei, Chile, and Japan. But that this is not enough for the treaty to come into existence. His future fate is uncertain, even though there are also proposals that the place of the United States within the partnership could be taken over by China or even by the European Union. In addition, according to the article, the fate of another grand, allegedly free trade agreement is also unclear. The Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the TTIP with the European Union, Trump did not mention it during the campaign, and the EU was also not happy with its terms. At this time, only Canada is in the midst of the TTIP ratification process. In my opinion, the idea was to get Canada to approve the TTIP first, and then use it as a backdoor for getting the United States into it as well. However, This scheme depended on Hillary Clinton being elected U.S. president. Considering that this did not happen, the globalist neoliberal planners suffered a serious setback. This is not to say that they will give up on the project that made them millions and billions of dollars. I'm sure that, as we speak, they are planning a comeback political strategy. 
they have a whole army of agents of influence in the U.S. Congress, in the intelligence agencies, the mainstream media, the think tanks, and the academia. This fight is just beginning. And Trump's view, make no mistake about it, is in the minority. According to the article, Trump's decision may also lead to the reformulation of the Russian international trade policies. The Russian-inspired Eurasian Economic Union signed a free trade agreement with Vietnam with the expectation that Vietnam would become its hub for the trade with the TPP countries. Now that the TPP has been consigned to the dustbin of history, the trade deal with Vietnam lost much of its significance. The Eurasian Economic Union will have to find other avenues to increase the market for its products and services in the Pacific region. The article also reports that at this time, Russia is negotiating a free trade agreement with Israel, which could become the Russian hub for the trade with the European Union, even while the sanctions are still in place. As I said earlier, the neoliberal globalists lost the battle, but they did not lose the war. I expect the so-called free trade lobby to increase exponentially the pressure on Trump in the coming period. We have yet to see how well he will sail through the storms being engineered against him and whether his ship will swim or sink. Lastly today, let's look at the Russian semi-tabloid press, the daily newspaper Komsomolskaya Pravda, the edition for January 24, 2017. On the front page, there is a photograph of a group of protesters burning the effigy of Donald Trump. The photograph was most likely taken in the evening of the inauguration day in Washington, D.C. The title, which is in big white letters, is Trump facing his own Maidan. The word Maidan, which refers to the events in Kiev that led to the violent coup d'etat against the legitimately elected president in 2014, has become a shorthand in Russian language to mean the regime change. And so the question is, is the violent regime change that which awaits the presidency of Donald Trump? Here are some of the answers provided by the Russian semi-tabloid press. In this article, the Komsomolskaya Pravda journalists ask several public figures, experts, and politicians for their opinion. For instance, Anna German, who was the press secretary of the former Ukrainian president Viktor Yanukovych, who was overthrown by the original Maidan, said that what was taking place in the United States at this time resembled the riots and disorder in Ukraine in 2013 and 2014. She claimed that she saw, quote, the face of Soros, end quote, and his millions behind all of it but that in the end, there would be no violent regime change in the United States. Valery Garbuzov, who is the director of the Institute for the Study of the United States and Canada within the Russian Academy of Sciences stated that he would not use the word Maidan because it assumed the violent overthrow of the government, which will not happen in the United States. However, he also said that the protests would continue and even grow over time and may result in Trump's in resignation. Alexander Rahr, who is a German political scientist and one of the foremost German experts on Russia, said that the protests were not organized by the people, but by the liberal elite whose paradigm after 25 years of dominance had been badly shaken. He also did not believe that there would be any violent coup d'etat but that the impeachment of Trump was very likely. Igor Korochenko, who is the main editor of the well-known Russian geopolitical journal National Defense, said that the atmosphere of hate 
cultivated by certain political forces and the mass media might lead not only to the Maidan type atmosphere, but also to the indoctrination of a specific individual or a group to try to assassinate Trump. And lastly, Vyacheslav Nikonov, who is a deputy in the Russian parliament, stated that the Maidan against Trump was being seriously prepared and financed by the supporters of Hillary Clinton and that the provocations against Trump would continue unabated. As we see, the Russian experts contacted by the newspaper all predict the premature ending of the Trump presidency. They are proposing several different unhappy endings, impeachment, resignation, even assassination. Why such an emphasis on radical scenarios? Are Trump's opponents really so powerful as to be able to stop him in this way? I think it is too early to be so apocalyptical. Most political players in Washington, D.C. are conformist opportunists, essentially corrupt cowards. If Trump proves that he can stubbornly hold to his campaign promises in the first six months of his presidency, most of them will come around to supporting him. It is still the case that you can make more money if you are a friend of the president than when you are his enemy. Dear friends, this is all for today. Thank you for watching. And of course, be cool and stay cool until the next edition of the Russian Newspapers Monitor. For just a small subscription fee, you can become a member of the NewsBud community and help keep this website running. Your subscription will provide you with full community access to exclusive content, including videos and articles from NewsBud's team of experts and analysts, as well as a members-only monthly newsletter from NewsBud's founder, Sibel Edmonds. Sign up today for full access at NewsBud.com.